At this time of year, we get so many questions on Gardener's Question Time about how do we get rid of the moss in our lawns. But before we try and purge this invader, perhaps we should realise just what the benefits of it are. It is an extraordinary bryophyte. There are many, many different types, over a thousand in the UK. So they're adapted to all different situations and circumstances. And they absorb a fantastic amount of carbon dioxide. Apparently half a square metre of moss will absorb a kilogram of carbon dioxide, which is a phenomenal amount. And also in cities or in any areas, it actually increases to the humidity because it absorbs a huge amount of water. So a little plant will actually, the surface area will be 30 times the size of the plant which means that it can hold a massive amount of moisture. And in cities, they're even developing artificial moss trees, which were actually designed to absorb the moisture. And then as the cities get very dry and hot in the summer, it slowly makes the air moister and more bearable. And of course, they absorb a huge amount of dust particles and gases and things from the air. So they help purify it and clean it. So really, mosses are wonderful things. And maybe we shouldn't always assume that we've got to get rid. So in my lawn here, I am fairly relaxed about it. But one way, if I did want to get rid of it, I would just use a springtime rake such as this and just rake it out. And you can see a lot of it is coming away. And this is quite an easy job, it's good exercise. And in commercial gardens such as Wisley, the RHS garden at Wisley, they have a lot of problems with the moss in the lawn. So they will scarify the lawn, not only in the autumn, which is the time that most people say you should do it, they also scarify them in spring, and they even scarify them in summer on lawns that are irrigated. And that really helps it. They also find that the more lawns that they feed, the lawns that they feed have less moss than lawns that don't. And that's obviously because they're boosting the grass growth at the expense of the moss growth. Moss growth. They also find that lawns with more travel on them, people walking all over them, have lost less moss than lawns that don't. So those are indicators of what moss likes. Also, it likes damp areas. So if your lawn is damp, maybe you should think about draining it. If you're not going to put in a draining system, a simple way is to get a garden fork, just put it in at 45 degrees, wiggle it around, and then do it again at about 25 centimetre distances across the lawn in lines. And that should help just open it up a bit and help it drain. Shade is a big thing as well. So if you've got trees and they're growing over and shading the lawn more and more each year and you find your moss is getting worse, then that could be the key that's tipping that balance. So here we are actually cutting the tops of the hornbeam. We've just started doing it. We've got about three quarters of the way along that stretch and that will reduce the shade on the lawn. Now we're not doing it for the moss because I actually don't mind moss too much, but we're doing it because they're easier to cut at a lower height. So the other thing is feeding lawns. Now, if you, if you don't do anything to your lawn, like this lawn here, which has got a fair amount of moss in now in very beginning of February, but come April, as the grass starts to grow and the days warm up and the days are longer, the grass will start to grow and that will be at the expense of the moss. So the moss will naturally die back. And that's also because the soil is giving out nitrogen with the nitrogen cycle. It gives it out naturally in the soil, making it available to the grass as the weather warms up. So it's naturally fertilizing itself in effect. So I don't bother to fertilize it but then the grass will take over and the moss will die out. So it's a seasonal thing. And that's quite a relaxed attitude to moss. I live with it and I like it. Now, if you're not like that and you want the perfect lawn that's a monoculture of just grass and you're not subscribing to the modern movement, which is to be more relaxed and to encompass herbs and wildflowers within your lawn, maybe mowing it a bit longer, and you're at the opposite end of the, the extreme, then you might use a moss killer. And there's something like Westland's Moss Master. There's a whole generation of these moss killers which actually have built into them microbes that when you, they, you put it on, 
the, the moss killer, it kills the moss off quickly and the microbes within the mix will actually remove all the dead looking moss in your turf. So you don't have to rake up and remove the dead moss. Um, and they also have fertilizers in it, which again, trigger the growth of the grass at the expense of the moss. So when you've got all this moss, you can sort of pick it up, put it in your hanging baskets, leave it in a pile for the birds or something to use for nesting, highly useful. Um, at this time of year, you can hear them very active now. Um, so, so that's moss and in lawns, but maybe we should just think about the benefits of moss. When I visit Japan, there are moss gardens, moss lawns. Moss is used really in a wonderful way and, and lots of people love it and it is stunning. And at Highgrove, Prince Charles, well, King Charles now, he made a moss lawn in his Japanese garden. And to do that, he cleared the grass. He then put polythene over the soil. He then put capillary matting. And capillary matting is matting that it absorbs water and holds several gallons per square metre. And then it slowly gives it up to the plant as the plant wants it. And then on top of the capillary matting, he put a bit of weed-free compost. And then they collected mosses from all over. And they collected some from Burke Hall, his residence in Scotland and other places. Now, if you are going to, and that lawn, that, that's a high maintenance lawn. They have to water it in dry summers or it goes a sort of khaki colour. They have to weed it. A more relaxed attitude might be um, someone I know up the road, he has that stretch around the edge of his artificial wildlife pond where you've got the liner coming up and then it goes up to the grass and he's actually put moss on that edge and he collected mosses from a similar microclimate to his pool um, and he collected little two pea sized pieces and he put them in, just rested them on the soil because they don't really have roots. They just take the moisture from the rounding. So you needn't bury them as such. And now he's got lovely swathes of moss around that edge of his pool and it looks beautiful. There are bits of grass growing in, but it's quite relaxed and quite wild looking. Now, when you collect mosses, if they're not in your own garden, you must remember three things. One, you must have the owner's permission. Two, it's not a protected area. And three, you're not collecting scheduled species of moss. Um, and that's pretty unlikely because there are not many of them around, um, except perhaps in parts of Scotland and places. But just bear that in mind and then go and collect them. And then you can use them for all sorts of things in your garden. I mean, if I wanted to make this a moss lawn, it probably wouldn't work well because it is just too sunny and light for many species. But if you chose a shady path, a shady mossy path perhaps, then you want to look Look at the, the microclimate of your path, select mosses perhaps from nearby or from areas with a very similar microclimate and that microclimate might just be a few square feet around it really. So, um, so it's got similar conditions of shade, of wind, of um, moisture um, and then collect those mosses and then just plug them in to bare earth and you will probably have to weed it if you want it to, it to be grass free but it can look wonderful and when you go to Japan you see beautiful mossy roofs so if you had a shed in the shade instead of having asphalt or something artificial on it you could make a lovely mossy roof. Um, I love seeing tufa so near here on riverbanks you see actual naturally occurring tufa which occurs in many parts of Europe and that actually incorporates moss it associates itself with moss and as the moss decomposes it's incorporated in the tufa and you see it on streams and things on these sort of rocky mossy tufery type edges and that looks really wonderful so if you wanted a water feature with maybe a spout of water coming out of a, a battered or sloping stony wall you could collect lovely stones full of moss um, build the wall from them and then you could actually get moss and stick it on the wall and this sounds weird but you can actually do that you can just collect nearby mosses get a bit of copy decks or similar glue but put spots on what you want to adhere it to and just put the odd spot on it and that will hold the moss onto the wall again because it's just taking moisture from the environment and it doesn't have the roots as such. So um, just think how you might like to use moss, maybe enjoy it. Understand that it is a fabulous, fabulous asset to have in your garden and then do work with it. I always remember when I was working at Highgrove, um, they had a most beautiful water feature in the garden. 
um, and it was a stone ornament and the stone wasn't made of durable stone so it actually um, did get eroded in the winters with the, with the freeze for action. Hi Beetle, hello darling. Um, and um, then, so Prince Charles used to wrap it up in winter, you see, so I've taken this moss from a similar situation and I'm just popping it on top like that. Um, and that will just stay, you get moisture from this environment, only need a tiny bit of blue if you can get it out. And so then Prince Charles or King Charles noticed that the bees would come out, particularly in winter, and, and they would actually drink from the moss um, on the water feature because it just held, oh here they are, it just held the moisture so well. And so he, he stopped covering it up in the winter and he just left it. So I was thinking, so there's a mossy ball there, instantly weathered. And I've noticed in my water bowl near my greenhouses, lots of dead bees. And I think what's happened is they've come in to drink and the water's too deep and they drown. So what I was going to do was I was going to get a stone trough or something from eBay or similar. And I was just going to put some soil in it, maybe capillary massing, matting, put some moss on top and, and add some water. So it's a nice, War, very shallow water area with a bit of moss around it so the bees can cling onto the moss and have some water. When the, in the summer at the pool, when the water lilies come out, you see them sitting on top of the water lily leaves and drinking, so that works very well. But it's nice to have water all around the garden for the bees in summer because that's one thing that they really do need. So maybe that might change your attitude to moss a bit. Maybe you think we don't get rid, but we encourage it. We use it in ways that it really helps the garden and helps the wildlife.